Hello, welcome to another paper review. And this paper is a logic paper. It is a uh, paper that deals with international law. Some of these topics are super fun, just so exciting. Um, actually, did I did enjoy reading this paper. Uh, my friend JD Work sent me this paper. He's like, hey, thought you might be a little bit interested. And then I spent, I don't know, something like 50 hours on it, probably. Uh, so there's a lot in this paper. It's, you know, the, the best and worst papers are pretty well written. Uh, if you want to look at other reviews of this type, I have a bunch of them on my YouTube channel. But we're going to go a little bit into depth. I'll try to go slowly. I get a lot of responses to these videos uh, from professors who are teaching courses in this kind of analysis of international law or international relations or cyber policy. So if you like this video, please send me a little message about what you liked and did not like. So let's get started. Uh, international law. Oh, my name's Dave Atel, by the way, if you don't know who I am. I don't know how you found my channel if you don't know me. Uh, the author of this paper's name is Kevin John Heller. Um, one of the things that I, I always say this is like I don't like to judge the people involved in the papers. I only like to judge the papers. Uh, but you can go, he has, I think, one video online about some of his other work, which is relating to uh, international um, uh, courts, not actually international courts, but uh, judicial remedies to try to bring torn countries together. So it's actually an, a good video um, worth watching. But we're going to look at this paper in defense of pure sovereignty in cyberspace. And one of the only reasons I look up people's work sometimes is to see if they've done like a lot of different things on the same area or to see if this is sort of like a one-off for them. Like they, they were doing a bunch of other work in international law and then they decided to focus on this cyber thing uh, just for fun. So we're going to give it a, a little quick shot. <coughs> the abstract here. States currently endorse three different positions concerning the international wrongfulness and you'll start seeing these sort of words like wrongfulness, that which have specific, more specific meanings in international law, of cyber operations that penetrate computer systems. And, and OK, let me start here. Words in international law are allowed to have very specific meanings. But words that are more related to the technology and the operational practice are apparently not. So cyber operations that penetrate computer systems located on the territory of another state but do not rise to the level of use of force or prohibited intervention. So intervention is another one of those uh, key words that you're going to have to go into. Okay, so there's three positions. The first position is that low-intensity cyber operations are never wrongful. The second is that low-intensity cyber operations are always wrongful. And then they'll talk about sovereignty being a primary rule of international law. And then the... Um, and they call that one the pure sovereignist approach, which is the approach the author favors. And then the third position is that although sovereignty is a primary rule of international law, you know, these things are only intentionally wrongful insofar as they cause some kind of physical damage, so what they call a relative sovereignist approach. Um, out of these three positions, um, the paper takes a very strong position that the rule of law, uh, or the rule, it's a, it's a rule of international law, and so they want pure sovereignty. So they're, they're very like tight on that. Um, I would say relative sovereignist is where the world has landed uh, and is much closer to being correct if you think about it as a practitioner. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So, uh, you know, we're going to go into this again, but pure sovereignty for cyberspace would make all cyber espionage a wrongful act. Um, what you find with logic papers... And if you're going, if you're a student or just simply a, a, a cyber policy person going through logic papers, um, you're going to find that logic papers kind of suffer from the same issue that all logical diagrams do, which is if you make one small, small screw up or you decide that one small thing does not need a proof, you can get to anywhere. You can derive anything, right? Zero equals one. Infinity and negative one are the same number, whatever it is. So all logical 
arguments, when they have any tiny flaw, suffer from this issue, right? So that's, that's part of the difficulty of it, is when dealing with, and it's almost a weakness of logical style papers when dealing with complicated issues that are not necessarily purely logical, because you can, by definition, get to anywhere. And in this case, the author gets to pure sovereignty, which is wrong. But being wrong is still interesting. So here's some thoughts on international law papers in general. Just in general. You, whoever you are watching this video, you can review them, even if you're not an international lawyer of any kind. Uh, there's a very small lexicon of things to know. It's not that hard. I know the international lawyers in, in, in this audience are like screaming in their heads that like, oh my gosh, I had to spend so much time in school. True. But also, but that's to become like an international lawyer where you can like argue for countries and, and you still won't make any sense because international law, look, my personal position is it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's not really supposed to. We'll get into why. Because um, it's not law really, right? Like it's not, even law is not often law. Uh, but international law is in particular not really law. And so if you are a viewer, and you're going through this kind of paper, you will find logical flaws. If you do the diagrams, if you write out the structure of the arguments, you will see these sorts of things. And I do not think you should be intimidated by where the documents go. Almost no documents in our system of anything with cyber policy go through any real peer review. So in some cases, you're going to be better at the peer review because you care than anyone who read it before. So don't worry about the fact that you're not an international lawyer, but you're reading a paper in international law. It's not a problem. It's really the opposite of a problem. And let's talk a little bit about what international law is and isn't. Um, the International Law Project here, a really good just series. You can just go through it. Each video is like 10 minutes. Uh, you can go through the whole thing, get a really good introduction uh, pretty quickly, to be honest. Now, once you go through this, it's also good to start going to read a few international law papers here and there. Like, um, you can read some of the famous ones. And then just, like, journey, venture forward. Learn what random people have written about international law. Um, you, could, you should probably read the Tallinn documents um, and so forth. But there's, like, international law is sort of like, there's, they call it sources of international law. They're like, we have conventions. We have customs. We have like really old stuff and like really kind of new, uninterpreted stuff. We have like general principles of the law that we recognize. We have uh, judicial decisions from like the you know, uh, you know, international courts, and then we have like teachings of highly qualified publicists. And this this paper is one of those things, right? It is a teaching of a highly qualified publicist, but. Also, so is this video where I make fun of his paper, right? So, like, the, the sources coming into international law are, are, like, it's not like there's a supreme court, right? So a lot of people think of the word law as hierarchical, and that's really not the case here. Um, and there's a bunch of important cases and concepts and stuff, uh, Nicaragua versus United States. What I love about international law when you talk to smaller countries is they're like, what is the point if every time we win a case, the bigger countries just ignore the ruling? That's a really common event. So even, even the case that they stand up, like all the cases they stand up in this document and other documents as like the prime examples and you see quotes and there's principle, the first principle of the Lotus case, all those end up either being ignored or changing later on, right? So Nicaragua versus the United States, the United States didn't exactly like agree with the decision uh, or a bit. In the Lotus case, they later on decided to rewrite how, uh, how the uh, law of the sea worked based on the fact they didn't agree with what the Lotus case came out with, right? So, but they're gonna quote pieces of the Lotus case, right? They're gonna say, well, this is the piece of the Lotus case that agrees with our position, therefore go with us, right? Uh, intervention versus interference is, is important. Uh, the Tallinn documents themselves are pretty important. And then I also just threw it there, like, you know, the United States' interpretation of what it can hack over Tor is pretty wide, right? Like, if it's on Tor, the United States says, we can hack it, right? So as part of law enforcement, which is 
you know, a very key issue. So it's like, you know, if you read other documents in international law, here's someone who talked about coercion, uh, Muhammad S. Halal. I don't know him personally, but what I liked about this paper is he, it's very current and it's very pertinent to the topic that we're at hand, right? So um, you can you can learn his perspectives on almost a very close issue to the one this particular paper is dealing with. Um, and again, you'll see him, this Muhammad guy, quote the Nicaragua case and, uh, you know, talk about all of these different things. So this stuff is like, you know, what I liked about this quote was that a lot of times it's the composite nature of breaches that are a prohibition. So um, I like that bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what Muhammad says about CNE. And again, CNE is a very Americanized term. That's an American military term, right? So it's as if they were saying, talking about differentiations between classified data and they used American terms like top secret, secret, you know, confidential, right? So that's a very interesting way to start stating things. Um, but uh, so he would say that uh, he would say that it does violate sovereignty, but not not the prohibition on intervention because you're not intervening with, um, you know, government processes or whatever. And another thing you'll see here, and this is just it drives me frickin bonkers, is when people decide to assign colors to different weird variations of a thing here. It's like black psyops versus white psyops. And. It's just, it's just not that simple, folks. Stop doing that. It's just really weird when, when people in this space do that. I don't like it. Um, so, all right. So, again, this definitely would agree with the position of the paper. So, Muhammad agrees with the paper. Muhammad says basically anything is going to be uh, – a violation of sovereignty, and it, and he's also going to use naval analogies to it. So what you'll see is a lot of argument by analogy in these types of papers. Okay. Um, nobody should hack anything ever is the position of the paper stated very quickly, and I will just read a little bit of this to you. So it says. Uh, the dissensus over how sovereignty functions in cyberspace undermines the ability of states to formulate cyber policy. States obviously have no right to engage in cyber operations that violate international law. When they do, they bear state responsibility for their internationally wrongful acts. Moreover, a state targeted by a cyber operation that violates international law is entitled to engage in countermeasures against the responsible state. Well, that, and the interesting thing about this is that it sort of opens the door to the idea that if every state is doing CNE, then every state is essentially engaging in countermeasures all the time, right? You did it to me. I'm doing it to you. I have a sanction because I thought yours was real bad. You have a sanction because I got caught and mine was real bad. So there, it sort of opens the door to this. But there's a whole element of international law that deals with state practice and what they always tell you, like, if you talk to anyone, is they're like, state practice is what actually defines international law, which is a very weird concept if you're thinking about what a law is. And we'll talk about state practice a little bit later. Uh, but if we had to just boil these arguments down, it is that computers exist in a physical space and are covered by territorial integrity issues, right? Like, er any violation of that computer is therefore a violation of sovereignty. And it would be better for everybody if all the hacking stopped anyways. That's the policy argument in this paper, is that nobody has an interest in the rule being anything other than pure sovereignty. So that's the first impression of the argument, right? So, And that's something that you're going to do when you first go into the paper, is you're going to be like, okay, well, how strong is the argument? And like, how far are they reaching is a question. And they're reaching really far, right? So, So... When a paper reaches this far, that means they've made some interesting choices. So let's look at the choices. This genre and, and similar papers of it have a tendency to do a few things. They misuse the Talon documents. So when the Talon documents agree with them, they, they, they cite them as if they are a religious text. And when they disagree or don't have a position on something, they say, well, it's not an issue, right? 
there's a confusion of like how states communicate to the world and to each other. And so th you, they'll sort of pick pieces out of press releases and then assume that that means that that state has made a deliberative process on international law with binding norms and stuff like that. So that's always very funny. Um, you'll also see in, in a lot of these papers an assumption that countries have a singular view and, and a singular unchanging view, which I think is, is super fun when an area is still being defined. Uh, so the best part of that is that like, like cyber law is, let, let's say it's 20 years old, but like they will, this is, international law is extreme, like derives itself way back, you know, like oh, super far. So they're like, well, you know, we're, we're going to treat everything the same. Uh, and then again, what you'll see in logic papers in particular is these assumptions of only a couple options, right? They'll say there's only A or B, when in fact C, D, and E are equally possible, right? And you'll also just see generic logic mistakes. There aren't too many of that those in this paper, uh, but you'll see them a lot in this kind of paper. So let's talk about the UN, GGE, and Tallinn. So there's like 40 experts that wrote like the Tallinn thing. And the problem with this is it's very rare that you find an expert in international law and in cyber operations. And when you do find them, they like, I could name a few um, uh, Americans, they tend to be extremely suspicious of how a lot of this stuff applies. So it's almost like the more qualified they are, the less they agree with these positions sometimes. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Colonel Gary Bond is one. Um, there's a few of them here where you're like, when you see them on the world stage, if you watch enough panels and videos, you'll see them and they'll be like, yeah, this is very dumb, right? They'll be like telling the entire audience off. They'll be like, y'all need to get your crap together, right? So that's like, you'll see these like, the almost the biggest experts will be like, okay, dudes, come with me here and let's look at the real world, right? So I, it's fascinating to me, right? But like, if you only know international law and you don't know operations, you can have a very a di completely different perspective. So, um, so the theory was that the X40 experts would like come together and, and com apply a consensus. Now, consensus doesn't necessarily mean they all agree. Consensus just means mostly agree or don't disagree too harsh or maybe only a few people really disagree. But sometimes those few people are the important people. So let, let's just, all right. This is like, um, he, here you can see he quotes highly qualified publicists, which is an international law term. Um, and so where it agrees with his argument, um, and again, it, Talon Manual 2.0 was very different from Talon Manual 1. And I, they refuse to acknowledge this when you talk, when you hear people talk about it. Because Talon Manual 2.0 is very much like the Talmud. There's arguments in the comments. It's like people are bickering back and forth. You know, one rabbi believes one thing, one rabbi believes another thing, right? Like, that's what it's like. I don't know if, you know, I've used this analogy before, but apparently most people have not read the Talmud, so who knows. Um, but it's very interesting. Like, to quote the, the Talmud Manual 2.0 as like a word of law is very fun. It's like and very amusing. Um, and again, countries will say things in UNGGE and Talon that they just don't hold. They'll, they're like, we will say stuff. It doesn't matter. We're like, whatever. We agree with you here. We don't, we don't really agree with you, right? So, um, you know, this is actually out of the UNGGE document. It says... At the national, regional, international level, states could consider putting in place impartial frameworks, policies, and programs to guide decision-making on the handling of ICT vulnerabilities and curb their commercial distribution as a means to protect against any misuse that may pose a risk to international peace and security or human rights and fundamental freedoms. States should also consider putting in place legal protections for researchers and penetration testers. So what you'll notice out of that is where countries are doing this, and the United States is, is putting together export control, right? It, you know, like, they're, it's sort of like 
they're kind of doing it. But there's enough weasel words here that, like, whatever they're doing will fit with this document. Does that make sense? So the positions change. The positions change all the time, right? So, um, you know, in the paper itself, they go over the history of this. And then you see, like, wait, but actually, you know, they came to a consensus. But then when they tried to get a little bit more specific about what was happening, uh, people changed their opinions, right? And that's very normal. That's very normal, like, in this space, right? Like, because they don't know what's going on yet. And the, there's no one educated in the space that's in the positions that they need to be in for this to work. So the United States is, of course, a primary version of this, right? So, you know, you'll get every four years a completely new position on a lot of different things. Um, so, like, you have to, like, state, what states say has to be taken with a grain of salt when it comes to this kind of thing. So, I, uh, in this particular case, when they talked about, you know, the IGE here is the International Group of Experts, which is the Tallinn people, of a bunch of people in a room in Estonia, or virtually. Uh, so when, when they cannot reach consensus, the document sort of assumes that its argument is going to be fine, right? So they're like, there's no consensus. So therefore, what we say will work. Um, but sometimes no consensus is a consensus that there's a lack of agreement, if that makes a sense. Like, sometimes they're saying, yeah, we don't have enough information on that, or it's, it's complex, and maybe you're not asking the right question. So a this is what you'll see. When there is not a consensus, papers will, will try to push through the argument as if that was an okay thing. And, and that's an issue with this paper in particular. Um, okay. There's a lot about rules, new domains, new weapons, that sort of stuff. But this argument is particularly flawed in the paper, right? So um, the theory that, that once you've defined how things work as a rule, then it applies to cyberspace essentially without modification, and therefore everything else follows, right? Like that's the basic argument of the paper. And... Just because computers could be in a physical location doesn't mean that you are extending a rule to cyberspace necessarily, right? Like, cyberspace is not in the computer in a sense, right? Like, and I think that's where a lot of these people get very confused um, and, and that you'll find them using a lot of naval analogies in this case. So um, – what he says is, there's actually no need to find a rule of customary international law that extends sovereignty into cyberspace. And that, this is the crux, realistically, of his argument. And so he does, he does the same thing about like freedom of navigation on the high seas is like an example. So we just extend our thoughts through that we had, you know, for fighting wars, we extend those through, through the high seas. It's just, you can't take, just be, uh, also, just because you have a particular process that works for, like, other domains does not mean it works for cyberspace. So even if it works for every single other domain you have, doesn't mean it works for cyberspace, right? That's, that's just life. And this is a problem with a lot of people's understanding of, like, they, they're like, we're going to extend it to every, just because it worked for every other domain, we will assume it works for cyberspace, but that's not the case. That's a fundamental flaw with this paper. And, uh, you know, he's like, we're, all right, he goes over all the rules. Honestly, I think I, I've hit the point hard enough. The, they, they talk about, like, differing views on nuclear weapons and whether or not, like, you know, rules apply to them. I don't think that's the same issue at all. And I don't think anyone I know would think that's the same issue. Um, so here's another issue with the paper, is that a single intrusion is not really the delimiting measure of cyber operations. And you'll notice he says low-intensity cyber operations as if there's a definition somewhere of low-intensity versus medium-intensity versus, like, medium-high-intensity like, you have better information on how to cook a steak medium rare than you do on what a medium intensity cyber operation is. 
And, and operations are usually hybrid. They're judged by effect. So the question realistically is, like, why are we even talking about penetrating a single computer? Penetrating a computer doesn't do anything necessarily. So, but they want it to be the, they want that to be the limiting measure. And it's just not. That's an issue. So we're going to talk a little bit about just like wordplay. Um, and that, you know, things he has in the paper that are just sort of silly. So this, is a, this was a paragraph that I was like, hmm, that's not how logic works. He's like, national security is a prototypical governmental function. Theft of not launch codes makes it possible for the perpetrator state to disrupt, maybe even neutralize, targeted states' nuclear defense capability. Therefore, theft of launch codes is interference with national sovereignty and governmental sovereignty. That's, that's not the case, right? Like, it's just not. There's no coercion applied. Like, if you sent a message to, like, the, like on Twitter, if, like, Trump was, like, typing out and he's like, I have the launch codes for North Korea, nuclear power will send soon and launch nukes, right? That's a coercive text. Um, that, that would be interference. But stealing them is not themselves that self interference it, just because something is possible doesn't mean you did it very weird very weird logical stuff um and then this other one where he like you'll see this a lot where he'll be like sometimes states have used the language of territorial sovereignty to condemn cyber operations and we're talking like in a press release or whatever right like and also sometimes they haven't right like sometimes they have these this is like it's very weird logic. Just because it happens sometimes does not necessarily mean that it's a rule, right? Like, maybe it means the situation's complex. Maybe it means someone just felt like typing the word sovereignty. They liked it. And they're like a 23-year-old press release person, right? Like, okay, so mutatis mutandis means to have make an argument that has sort of like, like just change the like you know the the words around a little bit, but it's the same argument. Uh, but it's not true all the time, and that's the funny thing about when people use Latin these Latin phrases. Sometimes they're like, no one will understand what I mean, so therefore, you know, keep the point polloi out. Uh, mutatis mutandis, merely penetrating a computer system located on another state's territory, should also qualify as an exercise of power. What he's saying is, I don't want to make the argument, right? Like. Um, the, here you see him talk about the lotus principle in the absence, right? The lotus principle uh, being from a, a case where Turkey and France had two ships collide and then, you know, they wanted to sue each other, but then they decided, you know, actually, they actually overrode a lot of lotus later on because that's when they started saying the person in charge is the flag of the ship um, or the state who has law. Uh, is the flag of the ship. So what you're seeing here is they're saying the mere penetration of a state's airspace, territorial sea, or land violates international law, uh, and you don't need a physical effect for that. Therefore, a computer system is. This, is. this is just wrong. This is the summary of a lot of like wrong thinking in international law in our space, is that just because it's it affects, it, like a principle of international law works in sea, land, and air, it should also work in the information space. And it doesn't. That's not, there's no mutatis mutandis. So I, if, if the author of the paper decides to watch this, they should just know this is the primary flaw in their thinking. And they probably will watch this. So I don't know, drink some rum and think something else. That is my, my theory on that. So. Mere penetration, I mean, he goes into this, uh, the most obvious counterexample is intercepting wireless signals, right? Um, and that doesn't violate sovereignty because the interception is considered extraterritorial. So I think what you should recognize is that states clearly also consider CNE extraterritorial. Just recognize that. Let's move on with our lives. So spy satellites are like flying so high, they're not in your airspace. Um, they do not violate territorial sovereignty. Um, so, uh, I don't. I mean, I don't think anyone would agree that the interception does not require accessing cyber infrastructure. Like, 
state practice says they don't, they don't agree, right? So if, if, you, if you take this part of the argument out, the rest of it falls apart because any part of a logical argument when removed means the rest of it falls apart. I, I love this section. This has just made me laugh. So um, state practice on land generally concerns, concerns abduction, which normally involves no harm. I don't know why that made me laugh. I'm just like, man, it, it does if you're the person getting abducted, right? Like, and, and he mentions the Budapest Convention against cybercrime. Again, very, very new. Also very, very clear. U.S. is a signatory to the Budapest Convention, and it does specifically say that accessing data that is not publicly available, by contrast, is extraterritorial exercise of power that requires authorization by the territorial state. So that is what it says. Straight up, but the states clearly disagree. They clearly disagree. So that's life. Um, so uh, if you read his argument, he's like the argument for pure sovereign disposition, you can't exercise any form of power. Penetrating a computer system in another state is a form of exercising power on that state's territory. No permissive rule of international law permits that penetration. Therefore, you are violating sovereignty even if you cause no harm, right? So su super simple question, is CNE an exercise of power as a website inside a territory, right? And, and again, the paper goes through to try to answer those questions. It just answers them incorrectly. But let's talk about a little bit other pieces of the paper. And what I loved about this is that international law can get very funny, right? So, so in the paper he says, very few scholars have explicitly defended the pure sovereigntist position, most likely because of the influence of the Tallinn Manual, which leans toward relative sovereignty. Similarly, while 10 states can safely be categorized as endorsing some version of pure sovereignty, only three have explicitly adopted that position, France, Iran, and Switzerland, and none have defended it at any length. So. What he's saying is that state, every time a state issues a, like an actual, and they do this occasionally, like, like here is our legal position on cyber operations. And e every state has slightly different legal positions, like New Zealand released one, I think France released one, everyone released one, it's a, it's a thing they do. And then the international law community gets very excited and they go read them and they discuss them and they mark them up in like a spreadsheet and they're like, put a little flow chart, who believes what. Um, so, so, but some of it's actually very funny, right? Like um, France, France or Iran believing in pure sovereignty, which would outlaw all cyber espionage or operations is just so fun because I'm like, first of all, France is well known and so is Iran and so are a lot of places for doing cyber operations. But also for like, you know, the reason it was called Olympic Games, according to open source reporting, was there were a bunch of people involved. It wasn't just the United States. And a lot of people have said it was probably, one of them was probably France. So, I don't know about China being involved. That makes no sense, but okay, whatever. Um, all right, so again, you will also have widely differing opinions, but also widely differing uh, areas of expertise, shall we say? Like, New Zealand's part of Five Eyes, so despite its size, it has a lot of expertise in cyber operations, you would assume, right? Like, it has access to a big SIGINT network, and it's, you know, important in its own way. Uh, I don't know about Guyana, Guyana, right? Like, that's even hard for me to pronounce, but um, I don't know how big their cyber operations team is, and your cyber operation team is going to inform your legal team, right? Like, so, like, I'm sure whoever that is, and they get quoted a lot. And I know some people from Guyana, and they're, they're really nice, and there's, like, you know, there's, like, there's some executives here, uh, Ryan Narain, for example. Um, and, but I just don't think their government has huge amounts of experience doing this, nor do I think Bolivia necessarily does. It's possible. Possible Guatemala, again, I just don't think they do. Um, so if you don't have a huge amount of experience, you, you're free to take any position you want. You know what I'm saying? 
pick whatever position. It's just hard for us to judge where that position comes from. And then I love, this is probably the, the funniest part of the paper, where the paper just sort of says, like, someone had said in the Wall Street Journal that the OPM hack was a cyber pole harbor. And um, consider, for example, the United States' cyber pearl harbor, in which China allegedly hacked the Office of Personnel Management and stole the personal data of millions of past and present government employees, including my own. It is difficult to see how that act of cyber espionage violated s relative sovereignty, given that it did not harm the access to computer systems. However, um, you know, like the theft had, oh my gosh, all this stuff. Uh, so they go on to talk about how people called it um, Cyber Pearl Harvard Smart. I, I just like, you're not going to find, don't quote like the Wall Street Journal, I guess is a lesson of life for this stuff. States are going to say whatever they want in the Wall Street Journal. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is international law and what it's for and why this paper is so wrong. And what it's for, it's like a dampening field for conflict. It doesn't end conflicts. It doesn't really resolve particular conflicts. It just sucks some of the energy out of conflicts via paying very expensive lawyers. And the whole point is to avoid overreactions. If the conclusion of your argument is that governments need to overreact to every little intrusion, that's the opposite of what international law is really for, right? So they don't explain why states would want to tolerate public cyber espionage. States tolerate public cyber espionage because the alternative is worse. It's pretty simple. So that's the paper. Let's talk a little bit about the future and how international, law, how international law needs to go forward a little bit, perhaps. So if you look at like recent Supreme Court decisions in the United States on the Fourth Amendment, you get like a mosaic theory of when enough information was gathered on any particular subject to make it a search, right? So, oh, you gathered my license plate information as I drove all around for an entire year. You know everything about me, right? So what they're trying to do is get away from binaries. Like, Oh, you were on the porch, that's a search. Oh, but you were in the yard, but not the porch, that's not a search, right? So, like, they're trying to get away from that because that stuff isn't working anymore. Um, and, and, of course, one of the other things you're going to see is that, like, electromagnetism is a better analogy in international law than, like, you know, naval issues or, you know, airspace law. It's just electromagnetism is better and this is a paper that I thought uh, was was much more pertinent to some some of like the better ideas that you're going to see, which is, you know, what is what are the test cases? And this is a very old paper from Horace. You don't see that name again uh, anytime, uh, anytime this time. So like, I think this paper was written in the '70s. Uh, I think it actually was written when I was born, 45 years ago. Uh, so Horace is was like. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, issues relating to people stationing, you know, pirate radio stations off of the, the continental shelf of Europe and then broadcasting it into Europe countries and stuff like that. And all the countries were getting really mad. And so there was a lot of interesting stuff there. And he wrote a pretty good paper about it. It's, n it's not a bad international law paper. So I would recommend this paper over the paper we're reviewing just because I think it's a good paper. It's kind of fun. But I want to give you... I was reading a science book uh, the other day. And so for like, you know, 40 years, we've been funding gravity wave detectors. And this is just a quick gravity wave detector diagram. And the thing about gravity wave detectors is they only work when they're a particular size. Up till then, they're pretty useless, except for like testing whether or not you can make them bigger. Let's see if we can get back to this one, the screen over here. Hold on. So, um, but the other, but the funny thing about them is, is that they're like, like, extremely sensitive vibration detectors. So if I have a gravity wave detector, or let's say like half of a gravity wave detector, so it's not big enough to actually detect gravity waves, but we're still working on it. But I've been working on it for forty years. 
what you really have is like the world's most insanely sensitive vibration detector. And if you have a couple of them plus a bunch of computers, the same exact algorithms that you need to detect gravity waves are what you use. You could use those to detect other things, right? So I was always very suspicious of this. I'm like, you're telling me the U.S. government funded an extremely expensive effort to like build the world's most sensitive vibration detection machines. And we didn't use it to like look through our own planet at other things. So I was always very suspicious. It's sus, as we say in the industry. And I'm like, let's say you have a satellite like this bad boy, and he's up in space. What's the difference between that <clears throat> and changing the border gateway protocol to make all your traffic come to me? And then given that I do that, I have to send packets to you to do that. What's the difference between changing your traffic so it comes to me using a border gateway protocol and then using a buffer overflow to do the same thing? It's less than you might think. Right? It's like hacky hacking, like just with your little keyboard like this, like you just type like that. It's closer to the analogy of listening to vibrations than it is to driving a, you know, boat through your territorial waters. So that's kind of where, where you're going to end up. That's where, the wor <clears throat> that's where the international law will eventually end up. This was a fun paper to read. <coughs> I got a lot out of it. I actually have a cold. I guess you can tell that. Um, I, will, I will put the link down below. You can read it. I think the conclusion is excitingly wrong, but that doesn't mean it's not fun to read these papers and learn how to review them and figure out why they're wrong. I think of it as little puzzles. Hopefully, when you analyze the paper, you come up with the same exact logical conclusions that I did and you agree 100%. And if so, you should type that in the comments. Uh, feel free to subscribe. And thank you so much for listening.